So welcome to another show. Uh, today we have Gwendolyn Dolsky, if I've pronounced that correctly, who is a philosophy teacher with a PhD. So welcome to the show. Welcome. Or I mean, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I guess Not... my energy drink hasn't hit yet. <laughs> yeah, early in the morning there, isn't it? So... <laughs> oh my oh, thank goodness. Okay, you. thank you for having me. It's okay. Um, so first things first, obviously most people are familiar with what philosophy is, but if you can explain it in your own sort of way, without people using Google to explain what it is. How would you explain what philosophy is from your side of things? Philosophy is the the heart of it. I'll just use the translation from the Greek. It means love of wisdom. And so that's a pretty large ballpark. So in Western thought, we start with Pythagoras, and then we go into Socrates. And that's really the origin of this investigation of understanding how the world works. So it could be anything from astronomy to the concept of justice, to the concept of beauty, everything was on the table. And that's where we have our modern day university setting. So even when we say PhD, that stands for philosophy doctorate. So if somebody is pursuing, let's say a PhD in biology, they are a philosopher, they are a lover of wisdom. So philosophy PhD is a little bit redundant, but I say that's the ballpark. And then just historically, somebody who was a philosopher or somebody who has contributed to the uh, existing body of knowledge, they have presented something new. That's what your PhD dissertation is. Professional philosophers, they can be cri critics, they can be proposing systems. What is the concept of right? What is the concept of justice? Does God exist? These are the kinds of questions that philosophy tackles. I describe it as problem solving for problems that don't occupy space. So if we were to have a conversation, for instance, about like this can, my energy drink, if it is here, it would be a very short conversation. We can use the five senses to come to that conclusion. There would be one person who would be like, no, but we would just ignore them. But then there's the question of, well, what is justice? It doesn't occupy space. So we have we can't use the five senses, but we want to say if it exists, then what exactly is that? And that's what philosophy is dealing with, things that do not occupy space. So is it a question of just asking the right questions to deduce answers through intuition or discussion, or is there something more to it than that? I think meaning that, for example, if... Um, if I ask, are there any married bachelors? And the answer is no. And I say, well, how do you know that? Um, you didn't have to do any kind of research for it. You didn't have to go see, well, wait a minute, what if in this country there is such a thing? No, we can just sit here and say, by definition, married and bachelor are mutually exclusive. So in that same vein, when it comes to philosophy and we're trying to discern, let's just say, if God exists, we're trying to see, well, what are the definitions that we're working with? What are the ideas and does it logically follow? For example, in medieval philosophy, Thomas Aquinas used the governance of the world, observing the cosmos to come to the conclusion that there must be some divine creator, some intelligent being. And he has five proofs for it, using logic and observing the world. And then you have another philosopher, David Hume, who comes along and says, actually, by all of our observations, it does not seem clear that there is any kind of divine creator or any intelligent being. So that's the kind of back and forth that philosophy will have. And that's just one little section of it. So with that question, actually, then, do you do you believe, based on your reading or your own thought process, do you believe that there is a God? And I know the word God has been bastardized over the years. Yeah. And we have our own interpretation of it. But do you believe there is a creator that created the space that we occupy? I, I've thought about this a lot. <laughs> the honest answer is that I, I don't know. And you know, nobody knows, nobody knows. Um, I am leaning towards, I don't see enough evidence for that case. But whenever I say that, I want to be very, very cautious because the people I'm close to, I don't normally re reveal that to my students because I never, when I'm doing arguments, I never want to impose my own thinking on them and just allow them the space to think about the material. But um, even my closest friends who know this, they are sometimes surprised at how much I enjoy literature that is from religious traditions. 
And that is because there is still a lot of wisdom embedded in texts, like in Eastern philosophy, in Buddhist texts, in Vedantic texts, and even in um, scripture, in Christian texts, Judaism. So I would not say that there is, um, I, I love the humanities. I love the beauty of trying to understand how we are here, why we are here, how are we supposed to navigate this existence that we've been thrown into? And I think that a lot of religious texts offer some, you know, some ways, some ways and mechanisms and some explanations. So I want to always respect people's faith, but at the same time, I have to acknowledge, I don't think that I have that. Uh, that's so that that's what I think it is the the evidence is just not there for me and I think that I ended up in my later graduate school years gravitating towards the atheist existentialist and that would be the camp of starting with Nietzsche I also really liked Kierkegaard um, he was more of a theologian but I liked the questions that Nietzsche was posing and then the existentialists like Simone de Beauvoir, Jean-Paul Sartre, Camus what they were doing with it, I thought was really incredible that once they removed the notion of God from the way in which we navigate our existence, that meant that you were 100% responsible for yourself and that every single moment becomes infinitely important. And I really, really liked that because if we're saying somebody else is in charge, there's a head honcho or there's an afterlife that is perfect, that it takes away from the present moment. And so I really appreciated it. So that's a long answer to say, as far as the existence of, of, of a God or of a creator or of a divine being, I honestly don't know, but that does not mean I don't have respect for the people who do think that. I always yeah. want to make that clear. Yeah. I think, for me, well, obviously, I know Nietzsche said something about God is dead, didn't he, at some point? But I've had my own thoughts on this. I've been pondering, as, as probably everyone, with some inherent want for answers I, I up until probably five or six years ago i i thought that god didn't exist and if we strip away all religion we strip away heaven and hell and all the scriptures if i look at it from like a more pragmatic approach the house that you live in or the microphone that you've got in front of you had to have a design for it to be created so an architect has an idea in his mind he draws out the design it's then built and here it is you know it's got rooms with functions it's got a kitchen it's got this that and the other a car is the same and i feel that my evidence for uh, creator, and I don't like these words because they have um, sort of connotations that I don't agree with, but they're probably the best words that we still have for it, that the the earth with its inherent structure and um, hierarchies within it and the DNA that we have, and even as humans, we have limbs that have functions and a brain and eyes and things like that, that I would think that there is some inherent design and it can't be random to an extent. And that's what, for me, science proves after trial and error and this, that, and the other, that there is a force of gravity. There is this, this is, there is that. What would your sort of argument against that be from just for my own sort of um, journey, as it were, from someone who studies philosophy on a much more uh, deep and professional level than, than someone like myself? Well, I think that one of the things that's helpful is uh, science is also just another mechanism. Well, not just another. I don't want to make it sound silly. But, um, you know, religion and science have both worked through this question of trying to understand why we're here. And what keeps us alive is not us. We didn't invent air. We didn't invent water. We didn't invent animals. Um, and so both science and religion have worked to try to understand what is going on. Um, I think that the the notion of, you know, the design, it seems to me that we are a work in progress. So what we have in front of us is because the things that didn't work died off. So this would be kind of the idea of evolutionary theory that what is in front of us and the way that we are is because it is useful for us to exist in this way. So let's just say even something like, um, like fear, you know, the fact that we have fear and anxiety and it can be very frustrating because it doesn't seem to be appropriate in today's world, the level in which we have it. But the reason we have it is that that is a survival thing. Our ancestors who did not have that didn't make it. They were, they were eaten. Um, even our capacity for 
love and strengths with friendships, um, even our capacity to survive when things seem very, very hard, like the passing of a loved one. These are all traits that I think are built into us so that we are effective at existing. So I don't know that it's that we're designed. Like if you look at, you go to an aquarium, right? And you see um, fish that just perfectly blend in with their environment. And we say, oh, isn't that a nice design? How they just perfectly match the leaves that they're right next to. Well, no, they evolved that way. The the fishies that, <laughs> that didn't fit in with their environment were eaten. So those are just the ones that survived. That's where I'm leaning toward. I don't know if it's such a perfection in a design. This is where I would think we actually did an interview on good is in the details with a friend of mine from graduate school who's working on the the research and thermodynamics and talking about the universe as almost being cannibalistic and destructive and that the universe is inherently fits our definition of evil now then he says what it means to be good is to resist that, to actually show deference for people, to actually show care for people, because the universe does not care about you. And it is designed to self-destruct, if you will, and all of its creatures are very violent towards each other. That the nature of the universe matter does not care about you. He gave the example, he said, just Go outside and skin your knee. See if the sidewalk, see, fall down. See if the sidewalk moves for you or says it's sorry. It doesn't. The universe doesn't care about you. So this was his work. It's a really daunting thing, but he is using science and understanding the way in which the world is being described in this way and what that means for us. I don't know if I would go so far as to agree with him on that position. That is just something that's out there. Yeah, I don't, I, but I can see the, the need for understanding the structure of the world. And then it doesn't have to remove meaning from our existence. The fact that we're starting to understand, let's say, maybe that there are, we're living in a multiverse, not just a universe. Um, Brian Greene, the physicist, has talked about this, which means that our existence is even tinier and tinier and tinier. But I don't think that that means that it has to lose any kind of meaning because still nobody can live your life for you. This is your life. You can absolutely decide about what, what you know, what you were dreaming, your talent, the way in which you want to be. But it seems to be further and further away from the idea of a head honcho who's in charge. And that's what I think. Um, again, one of my closest friends is an Episcopalian priest. I'll just put that out there. And I absolutely love her and have so much respect for her. And she has so much talent and she is extremely thoughtful. And we've even had theologians on Good is in the Details because I really, really love these conversations. But I know that um, my intuition is to get away from the idea that there is somebody in charge. But I think with um, the argument of the the walking on the sidewalk and, and hitting your knee, I think that that still proves the existence of some sort of rules that there are physical rules for for example and you know if we look at a parent as an example mm -hmm. a parent doesn't give the kid everything they ever want because it wakes up it grows up to be spoiled etc so i don't think that even if there is a man in charge which i don't necessarily feel that it is exactly that way um that you can't just have a, p a perfect life as it were because it doesn't you can't develop as an individual when, as you said about survival of the fittest um, or evolution, whichever of those you want to use. If you are weak at something, you die out and the better, the better survive with breeding or with, with the evolution of a species as an example. So you mentioned existentialism as well. So mm -hmm. on, on that basis, you're a, an advocate for a free will as a, as a, as opposed to determinism. Um, that's a really good question. I think that all, this would be another example of, I really like the, the French existentialists. I've enjoyed their literature so much. I don't know how they would deal with the science of the more and more we're understanding about genetics and behavior, although science doesn't completely understand the human being. So maybe for your listeners, the idea of determinism is that given the causes, the outcome is necessary. Meaning if you and I right now were to hit the rewind button on our life from the second we were born, we would end up in every, all the conditions were exactly the same. We could not be in any other place other than right here at this moment. So determinism 
this idea that you don't have free will because free would suggest something independent of causes and that that's impossible. Um, and that you are 100% matter, that that means there is no soul, there is no thought bubble floating around. The science is also leaning more towards this idea that your actions are caused. And so is that problematic with the notion of free will? Well, the thing is that the evidence seems to go more towards determinism, that everything is caused. Um, but the idea of free will, it is far more difficult to prove. So it, there is this question of maybe we would have to explain how we're the only beings who have it, right? That everything else is governed by the laws of physics, except for us. How in the world could you possibly prove that? Is free will an illusion? Just like it looks like the sun rises and sets, but when now we know that it doesn't. Some people have argued that the mind and free will is an illusion. It just feels counterintuitive to say that free will is an illusion I could be wrong. Maybe we do have free will. We just have not been able to prove how in the world that works yet. Um, but I think that, <laughs> I do think that there is a bit of, a bit of both, that there is some sort of choice involved um, taking in information and making some sort of decisions, but we could not ignore the relevance of causal factors that determinism talks about. So I don't know. I'm 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 at, I'm at odds with I'm at odds with well, that one. I've fence. often thought about what would let's say Simone de Beauvoir today be thinking about when we understand the genetics because one of her biggest things was that of course just as when the existential tradition is saying that we have free will one of her biggest questions is why is it that women in particular are stuck in um this you know this existential turmoil where they are more likely to act according to societal norms as opposed to ex expressing freedom as a human does so that's kind of a roundabout way of saying i i honestly i don't know we're so complex that it would be impossible to pinpoint all of the causes and because the reality is no but no person would share any of the same causes at all. Even if you're identical twins, you would still have different causal factors that would go into your behavior. Then there's that push and pull. Well, let's just say I, you know, I really enjoy traveling. Where did that come from? And then when I travel, I get all sorts of new experiences, which lends me to have new thoughts and new ideas about the world. So there has to be this interaction of me wanting to go out and have more choices and more experiences, and then that also attributing to new thoughts and ideas that I have. I think there's some sort of a balance between the, this is like the nurture versus nature debate. It's not conclusive that it were 100% either way. So, because I know Sam Harris believes that we don't have any free will, but I because I watched that podcast and I had a, had a think about that. It's not the first time I've thought about determinism versus free will, but you rekindle an idea, don't you, with new perspectives, et cetera. And I thought that, okay, well, if determinism is 100% true and we have, your life is essentially determined to an extent, that wouldn't, for me, explain that why someone would die from a heroin overdose, because it's basically saying that you are determined to be that, where I would say that, you have choices along the way. Yes, your path has some sort of determinism aspect, but you have the choice to go out to the cash point and go to the drug dealer, take the drugs, continue to take the drugs. And we have these sort of voices in our head, don't we? And I don't know if whether or not it's just me or not, but you have this choice versus this choice. This is the good choice and this is the easy bad choice. And depending on which one you choose over a period of time would determine where you, you will be in 5, 10, 15 years' time. And you also mentioned the sum of parts. So we are the sum of our experiences, which lends to the determinism theory, I think, quite well. But could you not use that same example as free will? Because you could say, well, actually, I choose to incorporate and learn about this information, which then allows my subconscious to use this additional information to give me more resourceful ideas, because otherwise, would there be any point in reading or learning stuff? Yeah. Well, I think that one of the things that determinism does offer, you know, when you, you're giving this example of like, let's say the, the heroin addict and the choices along the way, this is something that determinism does give that I like is that it really does make you humble 
because it's like I said, it's not completely out there, but this recognition that had you been born in a different location to a different family in a different body, different sex, ethnicity, race, if you had been brought up with a different religion, a different economic factor, your worldview, it's very humbling to then recognize that you would be interacting in the world in a different way. And I don't think it's fair to deny any of that, that that contributes to the way in which you experience the world. So I think that there's a way to go ahead and embrace that and take that. Yes, I understand the causal factors. Like I know that um, I, I really enjoy TikTok and I think that I got stuck in an algorithm that's talking about um, generational debates between like boomers and millennials and Gen Z. And somebody asked, why is Gen X off the hook? Why don't we talk shit about them? And I'm Gen X. So there were a lot of Gen Xers who were responding. And this is like a determinism type thing saying, you don't want to mess with Gen X. This is what we've been through. You can't hurt our feelings. Our parents already did that. <laughs> and just talking about... Um, the different cultural realities of just having been born in that time frame and how that has shaped us. So even something as simple as this kind of generational debate really lends itself to the idea that, yeah, you, there are causal factors. Now, what somebody like the existentialist would say is that there's still, um, when you encounter a situation, the way in which you respond to that, you are constantly redefining yourself. So for example, if somebody wanted to insult me, um, I don't have to bestow any meaning to that. The degree to which meaning I give to that is me lending meaning to that situation. So I have a choice in that scenario. Or let's just say, you know, if somebody injures themselves, um, how do I respond to that? Am I going to redefine myself as somebody who's helpful or somebody who is a coward and runs away? So we can't, determinism can't predict the future because we don't know what situations we're going to be in. And the reality is, in new situations, we are constantly redefining, solidifying who we are, learning about ourselves in situation. It's like Marcus Aurelius says something along the lines of, um, it, you don't have power over outside events, but we have power over our thoughts, don't we? And that's right. Yeah, that's a really um, important thing I think about every day. You know, we don't necessarily have power over what happens, but we have power of how we look at things and looking at maybe the optimistic side versus pessimistic side. So we've absolutely talked about a few things now you're obviously a teacher so you mentioned at the start that philosophy is quite a broad area what are your sort of areas of specialism mine is mine is existentialism so i really like the the literature that the existentialist cranked out and i my phd which is years ago now um but was focusing on this notion of what does an art what does a philosophy philosophy argument look like. So a long time, it had just been pure logic, pure reason. Here are the premises. Here's the conclusion. But what the existentialists offered was talking about the questions that they wanted philosophy to address that don't have tidy, objective conclusions like death contemplation, anxiety, what is faith, what is love? And they wrote fiction as a way for one to engage in those ideas and that that is the reality of human experience. We can't reduce ourselves to just some absolute. So I've always really enjoyed this question about what is it that literature offers in terms of philosophy and bigger questions and why is it that it works? So for example, you have the philosopher Immanuel Kant and he has a great ethical theory but you don't feel like being a good person after you read his stuff. <laughs> it, it just appears being an asshole. They are just going to read Immanuel Kant and then they'll be able to memorize the logic of his theory, as opposed to something that's quite beautiful where you have a lot of moral tales, something like, you know, even Harry Potter, where you have a lot of moral reasoning that I know when I was reading those stories, that there was some moral reasoning that was coming through in there where you just felt it and you understood and it just resonated. I'll give you an example. There was one that really hit me. It was in the first story of where the young Harry Potter finds a mirror in the basement of Hogwarts and he stares in it because he can see his parents in it. And Dumbledore lets him know that people have wasted their lives in front of this mirror because the mirror shows you what you really want to see. 
And that just hit me because I lost my father when I was 14. And I was imagining myself, if I could sit in front of a mirror and see him, how long would it take for me to move? How much of my life would be on pause to indulge that, to get away from the reality or not understanding that he's part of me in some other way. For example, I resemble him. I'm a bookworm just like him. I would be giving up moving about my own life in order to just settle in the past and, and, you know, instead of really honoring what it meant to be his daughter. So that kind of thing that comes through with fiction. So I'm reading that like in my twenties, right. Is something that brings us, it, it, it speaks to another part of our humanity, our capacity for empathy, our capacity for creativity, for visualizing, interacting with literature and, really hitting us in a way that pure reason cannot. So my area of philosophy is that I've always been fascinated with the way in which one moves about philosophically, not just the theory. And it took me a long time to realize that this is what I really loved because, you know, when I was younger, I just wanted to pass my exams, get the thing written. And I remember my thesis advisor looking at me when he would read my drafts of my work and he would say, what concerns you? And I don't think I really understood the significance of that question. It was the most important question you could have asked. And later in my adult years, I realized that what I was really fascinated with more than the theory, but what did it mean to live philosophically? This is one of the reasons I'm intrigued by Socrates, the person. I'm intrigued by even Descartes' story, the modern philosopher, the father of modern philosophy, even more than his theories, the fact that he had to run around Western third, uh, Western Europe because he was considered to be dangerous and how brave that is to posit theories. And what is that like to be thinking like that all the time and to offer something new? That's And the existentialists, of course, they, they were out in cafes all the time. You can still go to Paris, go to the cafe where they worked, and you can have a drink where they were all the time. They were always out in the public. They love theater. They love music. That is one of the things that I really like about philosophy is learning more about the philosophers themselves and what it is like to be that thinker. You know, you mentioned the Harry Potter thing. The first thing that came to mind is that you... So we we have, I don't know if you've experienced this as well, but I'm sure everyone has. You hear something or you see something and you feel like you were meant to see that thing. It has this like internal resonance. Do you feel that that was the same for you with, with the Harry Potter situation? And if so, have you got another example of something that you felt like this was definitely meant for me and I have to take note of this? And maybe you missed it for the first time, but came back second time and realised that that lesson was definitely meant to be learned. That's a really great question. I think that happens to me. Like I said, I am a bookworm and that happens a lot to me when I am, I think it's one of the reasons I enjoy teaching because somebody might ask, let's say, I mean, I've been teaching philosophy since 2006 and I always teach Socrates's apology, um, his trial, his defense, and other theories that have just remain, remained a staple in my work. And somebody might wonder, how can you talk about the same thing over and over again? And it's like, it's like what the philosopher Heraclitus said, you can't step in the same river twice. And one of the reasons why I'm able to go over some of these classic works of literature, especially something like Socrates, um, is because I am not the same, the world is not the same, the students are not the same. So every time there is some sort of a new engagement, I can't think of anything quite as significant as the, as that Harry Potter thing. Cause I, like I said, that resonated so much because I put myself in the shoes and it was such a great moral lesson in that story. Other people will pick up different things, but for me, when it comes to something like Socrates is describing, what does it mean to be good? He's asked, he gives us this response during his trial of saying, hey, you know, you might be wondering if this could cost you your life, this pursuit of philosophy, asking people questions, why don't you just stop? Because this could get you killed. And his response is, because a good person acts according to what is just and what is right, not according to whether they will live or die. That is what governs their actions. And that definition, which is just a line in this 40-page text, 
has always stuck with me whenever I see somebody doing something extraordinary, that that is actually what they are doing. They're putting the concept of rightness or wrongness as the guiding force behind their actions. And I remember reading Mandela's uh, memoir and he describes, you know, being on trial and the death penalty was on the table and he and his other defendants, they decided that whatever verdict came back, that they would, if it came back as a death penalty, he writes that they were not going to challenge it because they were going to make South Africa enforce their existing laws. And I thought about Socrates in that moment of the amount of bravery it takes to put your life on the line for the notion of what is right and what is good and what is just. And that strikes me. You can see that with Malala Yousafzai, the idea of women's education is of more value. And that is what is going to govern my life. And it's just really, it's really extraordinary when I see people being able to do that. Yeah, it's, it's a, uh, again, I don't know who, who actually said this, but it's, don't describe what a good man is, be one instead, essentially. It's a, it's a stoic or philosophical quote. Here's a question then, because it's come, I don't know where it came from, but from what you just said. So we talk about being a good man and that, you know, we need to do the right thing and be ethically good. First part is that who defines what that ethics or the ethic is? Is it you? Is it me? Is it society in general? And two, here's a, a vegan example. Vegans think that, you know, we shouldn't eat meat because it's it's ethically right. But who are we to, to question the ethics of nature? Because there are other animals that eat other animals, um, uh, vegetables, you know, who says that they don't feel pain, for example. Who, where do you Where do you draw the line between ethics and who defines what ethics are in in that in that sense yeah with with ethical theory we have some thinkers who have been able to or they have worked out ideas of how do you define right and wrong some people want to make the case that it's relative it depends on where you are I, I personally don't think that it is relative I think that there are some moral truths that I feel comfortable I feel comfortable stating, like I feel comfortable saying that um, genocide is wrong. I feel comfortable saying that in the same, you know, in the same way as I say slavery is wrong. I don't have any problems making those claims. And then this question of, well, wait a minute, how do you prove that? Or let's just say in the um, uh, American documents, this idea that all men are created equal. It's like, well, wait a minute, how do you explain that? How do you justify that? And I think that some of those big ideas is that we can take a look at well, what is the defining trait of the human being. So I'll tell you how I would try to do it logically. The defining trait of the human being is an autonomous being made for long distance movement, has the capacity to reason, has yeah, has has autonomy, is meant is meant to flourish. Um, when you interrupt that unnecessarily, you are doing something wrong. In the same way I could do something wrong with use my microphone incorrectly. It's designed in a specific way and it's possible for me to not have the buttons all right. And it's like, you're doing it wrong, fix it. So that means I have to act according to the nature or the design of this. If I were to take a human being and to treat them the same way that, let's say, as though they were not autonomous, if I were to treat a human being like I treat this can for my energy drink, so something to be used as a mechanism, that is something that is wrong because that is not what a human being is. So when it comes to ethics, I think some um, some general ideas, you know, we're going to say harm is not good, but um, we can't just leave it there. Like, because it's possible for there to be some sort of harm or injury and in it being justified. So I would add unnecessary harm is morally problematic. Now, the question that you have about vegans and with animals is that it's it hasn't been that long in the Western tradition where animals have been included in moral thinking. And that really came about, I think, through utilitarianism with Jeremy Bentham, this idea that animals can feel pain and it is wrong to cause pain unnecessarily. So I think that there are some broad things in ethics that we can go ahead and establish. I want to be very clear. This is what I think, because you could have another moral theorist on here and they will argue something different. So this is the conclusion that I've come to. 
this um some of the issues like about veganism and all that i'm i think that part of the part of the problem is that vegan and vegetarians are finding it's not so much the um eating of animals but it is the amount and the excess and the manner in which animals are treated for our consumption that is problematic so there's the moral uh utilitarian philosopher peter singer who has he he's vegetarian based on this case that the amount of pleasure he could get from biting into a burger is minimal considering the amount of pain that the animal had to suffer in order for that. So therefore it is wrong for him to have the burger. Now, if he were alone and stranded and he was, you know, needed some energy, some fuel in order to be rescued and hike his way out of, let's say he's trapped in the middle of nowhere and there is an animal, let's say a rabbit there, and he can do that to sustain himself then that would not be wrong. That could be warranted. I think that that is the argument that he would give. But on that vein then, for like a lion or a tiger that eats another animal alive, that's the rule of nature. You mentioned the um, the microphone mm -hmm. as an example. If we go against, and I'm not using this as, as, as sort of the same thing, but if we go back to the start where we talked about an inherent design of the universe or of your mic microphone, are, are you basically saying then if you go against that something from a design perspective that's where it's to see where it's seen as being wrong i think like in 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 every day when things are not complicated and we say something is wrong like if i say two plus two is five we can say that is wrong that goes against the principle of mathematics and maybe i could say you know what but in my heart i just really feel like two plus two equals five it's irrelevant to my subjectivity or if somebody wants to say you know what? i just don't believe in gravity it's like that's fine you can go ahead and not believe it it still is it doesn't matter so there when we use the concept of right and wrong just in our everyday or let's say you baked a cake and you messed up the ingredients and the cake comes out all wonky or something like that and you could say like oh i did something wrong something doesn't fit so in that same vein where we're using right or wrong we mean that something is amiss something is not adding up and i think that that can be applied to behavior to laws to policies if something is causing if something is interrupting a person's ability to flourish, to excel in their talents, to exist without, you know, mindlessly. So like if there were a law that came out in the United States tomorrow that said, you know what, women can no longer study philosophy, I would say that is a bad law. That is a wrong law that's interrupting somebody's capacity to flourish, to use their mind. Um, I think that that would be that would be the the measurement. So as far as animals in the wild that are <laughs> going after each other, that are just in this horrific manner, they don't have that capacity to reason. It's not interrupting what they are. You see what yeah. I mean? Like they, yeah, it's so, not. Okay. They, so you're saying if you're aware of, if you're aware of something being right or wrong, you then should pick the direction of being right so children for example they might not be aware that something might be right or wrong but because they are naive or oblivious to the fact that this is right or wrong they are in some respects uh, let off the hook in some in some regard yeah because they don't um well a lot of a lot of ethical theorists i mean it was it was let me back up bentham jeremy bentham and utilitarian theory focuses on the notion of um suffering and the notion of pain and the notion of pleasure, that those are the governing factors. And that's how animals were included in the community when it comes to ethics. But before that, everything hinged on reason. And a lot of our laws do right now. So the notion of, let's say, a, a child who has committed a crime is not going to get the same kind of punishment as an adult, even if they committed the same crime because their capacity to reason. Or if somebody's capacity to reason has been diminished in some way, they're not going to be held accountable. Like if somebody has schizophrenia, they're not going to be held accountable in the same way. So reason, the ability to see right and wrong um, without any kind of interference is essential. If you're a defendant, you would want to try to argue that your capacity for reason was somehow manipulated or problematic. And if you're the prosecution, you're going to want to say the, the capacity for reason is entirely intact. 
So the way that you could punish or reward somebody is based on the notion of they could have chosen to do otherwise. So that is what is established. So that has to do with law and that has to do with ethics. Now, what I would argue, you know, against a type of relativism is that if you say there is no such thing as right and wrong, then we have no system of laws. That means that somebody could go into court and say, you know, well, I didn't think there was anything wrong with distributing all of this cocaine. And we'd have to say, well, therefore it is not wrong because you don't think it's wrong and everything is subjective. So we have to have some sort of a foundation for laws. But even the importance of moral theory is extremely important, especially now, because one of the things is that technology outpaces existing law. So we're having this technological um, advancements, and we don't know how to respond to it, or there are no laws in place for a lot of things that are just, they're simply outpacing existing law. So it's understanding of rightness and wrongness is absolutely essential for, yeah, for, for growth. Like I, I think, especially with technology, I'll just give a quick example. Um, the Titanic did not break any laws. But that would be an example of technology that outpaced existing laws. The law at the time was that a ship needed to have 16 lifeboats minimum. And it met that. It's just that it was much bigger, right? It didn't make sense. So if you are a good person, if you're a rational person, and if you care about human life, you'll be able to put into place the what will keep everybody safe, what makes sense. And that would be the right thing to do, even though it's not legally required. And I think that we're, we're learning a lot about that now let's say when it comes to the amount of time we spend on social media, TikTok, algorithms, um, how are we communicating less with each other as a result, the need for eye contact, affection, vulnerability, these things that make us human, that make life really good and our friendships and our relationships so important. And we're trying to get away from that because the technology is pushing us. Now, I don't know how laws are going to be, but I think it's worth paying attention to as a cultural shift because it's going to make people less happy when they are addicted to these things. And it's going to remove the, the beauty of human interaction. You mentioned the capacity there as an underlying concept that you know, for children or versus adults, you know, we have a, a different mm -hmm. way of observing things or if you're schizophrenic, for example. Now, if we use that on a, a, philosoph a philosophical basis, you know, I would consider myself a child in, in the philosophical realm, whereas you're someone more experienced in that area. So what philosophical question have you been wrestling with, with all of your sort of years of experience? And what's the, yeah, what is the question that you've been contemplating most on uh, of late I think there have, you know, I, I don't think that I'm alone in this in that I think because of the pandemic and things being shut down, that there are a lot of people I know who are sitting down and reevaluating what is important for me. What do I care about? Where do I need to go? Who am I spending time with? And I'm not, I'm not any different in that regard. Something I have always been been interested in is this question of what does it mean to live philosophically? And also what does it mean to live life well? Where I've been interested in how the ancient Greeks tackled that question. And it seems like the science and the evidence is catching up and actually confirming a lot of the things that they were writing about. What does it mean to live life well? It's the driving force behind the the podcast that my partner Rudy Salo and I do, Good is in the Details, this idea of interviewing different experts and getting to the heart of what is the driving force behind their work. And the point is that this question of what does it mean to live life well, we can't have too narrow of a definition of it because we're going to leave out a lot of people. But there still needs to be some sort of a boundary there. And I think that actually Aristotle was onto something because he said happiness or the Greek term eudaimonia was the object of life. And once we have that target, that we're then able to focus all of our steps to go in that direction and not lose sight of it. And that happiness or eudaimonia, which is meaning a flourishing of the mind, that it gives that space for many different areas of talent, whether you're engineering or a musician, right? Um, if you like law, if you like politics, if you like gardening, if you're a chef, all of these things that are distinctly human things, 
that you can focus on and excel at. Friendships, relationships are also in there. I think that we don't talk about what makes life enjoyable in education. We teach people like, here's some historical facts, here's some science, here's mathematics, but none of it means anything if we don't understand what it means to live life well. And I think that there are some answers there. And that's one of the things that I really enjoy thinking about and learning more about, about how people exercise their talents and what they're contributing and how they feel quite full and vibrant and energetic. And it's so important. It's not just some lofty question. It's important for economists. It's important important for politicians. Because if you want to have a flourishing, thriving society, you need to understand that people have to be content and happy and excited. That's how you get creativity. That's how you get innovation. That's how you get, you know, even in medicine, that's all of that is the heart of the driving force. And it is what we talk about the least. Yeah, I think for me, if living well would be becoming the best version of yourself, but having the least um, and but living in, within harmony of everyone else still, because you can, as you said earlier, you know, you could murder people and, and take stuff from people to give yourself the best life, but you're not living within harmony of everyone else. Exactly. And that would not, that would not make you excellent on any level that mm -hmm. would, the, the idea of destroying in order to prop yourself up is it's, it's nothing. It, it won't, it won't do it. It's the reason why is because you're measuring your worth based on somebody else, as opposed to yourself and what you're capable of. So in a grand, you know, in a very grand example, like, like murder, um, that's inherently problematic. Um, but even in a, a milder example, like back to the social media thing, if you're looking at it and constantly comparing your appearance or what somebody, what somebody else has or the relationships to yourself, you're diminishing your self-worth. In fact, I've told my students, I've challenged them to try to not look at social media or emails first thing in the morning. Don't grab your phone and look at it first thing in the morning. The reason is because the first thing in the morning, think about what you want to get out of the day. Because as soon as you pick up your phone and you're on social media or checking emails, you are responding to what other people are asking of you, or you are thinking about what other people are doing. And neither one of those ways is a good way to focus on self. So when you do want to work towards your own happiness, it is when you are honoring your thought process and what it is that you want to get out of the day. Yeah, another Marcus Aurelius quote I, I think about in the morning is, um, think about what a precious privilege it is to be alive because you should be grateful for the fact that you've got a new day and as you said about them planning for the, for the day. Coming back to another Harry Potter uh, analogy, <laughs> the Horcruxes where... Um, obviously Voldemort has killed that many people where he split his soul. Do you think that's it's a case of that as well, where coming back to your previous point, where you do you tear down society to make yourself better off, that you have this, you you have a a, um, a situation where you feel like your soul's being destroyed, or people talk about this for Monday morning, don't they, where they go to work, but it's destroying their soul. Do you think there is a an element of that in terms of we have our own resonance or balance that we need to fulfill within society. And if we, as you've talked about quite a lot over the course of this conversation, if we divert away from that path, it feels wrong. Yeah, I think <laughs> there's, there's a couple of things about that. Like when it comes to, when it comes to work and I know that a lot of people feel like it's so sucking. Um, I do think it's possible that with work, if it's not, you know, one of your passions or something, or maybe it's a stepping stone to something else, or maybe it's just a summer job for a bit of an income for somebody who's, let's say, 16. Um, I do think it's still possible to show up with happiness, with vibrancy. So for example, um, if somebody is a barista, let's say at Starbucks, you have the capacity to improve somebody's day. Maybe somebody, maybe it is Monday morning and this person feels like crap and they do not want to go to work and they stop by Starbucks to get their drink and that morning smile and that thank you 
could actually be, you could be impacting their day. Or maybe when you are the customer and going in and maybe the server at the restaurant, maybe you're the last person on their shift and their feet hurt and they just want to get home. You're the last table. You have the ability to look at them and to treat them with respect and maybe make the end of their workday the best. You're now in their work environment. So I think that we should... I think that it's important to be conscious of what it is when we're interacting with the other, that we are part of somebody else's space and that we have the power just through a smile or a, how are you? Although I know that sounds like such an American thing, the how are you, but you have the capacity with, with a smile and with respect to be the best part of somebody else's day. And so even when work can feel like it's fragmenting you, and I think that this is a bigger cultural problem. We're in response mode. We're in response mode culture. Because of the internet, because of emails, there is no time away from work anymore. And what that means is that we just have to be more diligent in honoring the space that we have for ourselves, for our family. Like I know I have to set my phone to turn it off for a while so that I can read fiction for fun. Like I that's that's what I enjoy doing. And I've gotten away from that because I am on social media, podcasting, answering emails. I'm doing so much where I am responding to other people, but I found that I'm the happiest and the calmest when it's like, I can just indulge in a really great thriller mystery, which is my favorite thing to do. And I need to do that. If you feel like your soul is fragmented, I think maybe ask yourself, what are you doing with the first part of your day? And are you in response mode? Think about maybe write down three things that make you the happiest. It can be a comp to pick up the phone and have a conversation with a friend instead of texting them. Do that. Um, instead of just liking their stuff on Instagram, pick up the phone and call them. Go for a walk. Listen to a good audio book. Maybe you really like going for a jog. Cook a healthy meal. Look up a new recipe and go to the store and get all the ingredients and try something new. Try something new. These things will bring life back to you because you're going to focus on yourself, on your thoughts, on your body, and you won't feel so fragmented. So one of the, one of the best um, pieces of advice, this comes from the seven habits of highly effective people. And it was the first piece of advice. And I have to remind myself of it is focus on what you can control. And this is like a stoicism type thing. When the world is pulling you in different directions, Focus on what you can control and that'll bring back some peace so you can get your soul back, not just handing it over to these different areas. When when you were saying uh, pick up the phone, I just kept, and, and you said it a few times, that I was just thinking of um, Wolf of Wall Street when he was like, pick up the phone and start dialing. That's what it reminded me of. <laughs> <laughs> but genuinely, That's it's, right. good, it's a good uh, piece of advice. I think the other thing that you said as well, where, you know, if someone is going into to a restaurant and it's the last person it's it's the person's last order or or last table for example if you go in with the idea of leaving things better than you find them whether it's someone's mm -hmm. house whether it's a person whether it's um uh, a restaurant where, whatever it is if you go in with that attitude you'll always be respected by other people as well because if you're going in and you're making things better not only will it be a, a better for them it will be better for your soul as well um, you have mentioned Socrates a few times as well, not necessarily in that chunk, but over the course of the conversation. Is he your biggest inspiration within philosophy? Absolutely. I can remember it was my second semester of university when I took my first philosophy class. And I knew we, we started with reading that with his trial. And I knew right away that I was going to major in philosophy. That was going to be my studies. And I like I said, I've read the trial over and over and it never gets old. And I just think it's such a beautiful piece of literature. It's very inspiring. Can you explain the trial in, in very uh, a brief and simple terms for, for those? Who <laughs> yes. Um, so Socrates never wrote anything down. Everything we know about him is from his student, Plato. And Socrates was, he had this he had a, a, a vision, a message, if you will, um, from a friend who visited an oracle, the oracle at Delphi or Delphi, tomato, tomato, um, visited the oracle and asked who was the wisest person. And the answer was Socrates. No one is wiser than Socrates. And so the friend tells Socrates this, and he looks at it as though it's some kind of a puzzle. 
He knows that he is not the wisest person. There are people who are much more, much wiser than he is. And so he went, went around Athens and would publicly interview people to gauge their wisdom that he could learn from them and maybe say, hey, the Oracle has made some sort of an error here. And he realized in his dialoguing with people, the truth of the Oracle, that actually it's not so much that Socrates is the wisest person, but that he has the humility and the curiosity to understand that he can continually learn more. And a lot of people, they get stuck. They think, I read this much. I have this degree. I don't need to learn anymore. And so we learn from Socrates that wisdom isn't actually a collection of facts and information. It's not braggadocious. It's the humility to recognize that there is always more to learn. It's curiosity. And from that, I find it to be extremely inspiring and governing my life. I love um, picking up things even outside of my field, things that things that scare me a little bit. I just I have on audiobook Neil deGrasse Tyson's book on um, astrophysics for people in a hurry. And it scares me a little bit because I don't know anything about astrophysics. But there is kind of this joy of like, you know what, I'm going to know something more today. And that's where I think Socrates was was right, that that's what makes a society better. It's also what makes him better. And this idea of delving into conversation so that the other person realizes more about themselves and he realizes more about himself. So sometimes we think about wise people as they retreat from the world and they're meditating I'm not against that. I think that that is a good, healthy thing to do, but that is not the only step. You learn about yourself through dialogue with others. It's a way to connect with, with, with other people. It's a way for them to learn. And that is the, the art of dialogue and conversation that I think is getting lost today. So I think Socrates is even more important today. Yeah, I think a lot of people don't have the attitude, do they, that you can learn something from everyone you meet. It doesn't matter how silly they may seem or how idiotic they may seem you can still learn something from them whether it's the way that they always have fun for example they don't take last year seriously as, as an example so we can always learn something from from everyone if someone wants to get started in in philosophy and start to read some literature or start asking themselves some questions where would you suggest that they start i really love the book by Carl Jaspers um, and Jaspers is J-A-S-P-E-R-S. And he has this series of introducing different philosophers. And one is, it's only about 90 pages. So it's either a long essay or a very short book, but it's on um, Socrates, Buddha, Jesus, and Confucius. And he talks about what these four thinkers have in common the way that they lived their lives and what we can learn about them. And it's actually, I'm influenced by Carl Jaspers because he was the one who was reading about Socrates in terms of this interaction with people, that that's where a lot of the wisdom came from and humility. I recommend that because most people are familiar with at least one of those four figures. And you can actually learn a lot more about that four figure by seeing the the comparison to these other um, to the other three great men. So I always recommend that as a starting point and maybe watch the movie, the matrix. <laughs> there you go. So if anyone wants to, to either reach out to you or, or anything like that, where would they find you? Um, if that makes sense. Yeah. Well, on Instagram, I'm at prof Dolsky. And then we've got the the podcast. Good is in the details pod at gmail.com. And that's a, that gets checked often. <laughs> that gets checked more than any of my other emails. But yeah, with Instagram or um Twitter, I think I'm I am at G for Gwendolyn Dolsky. You could be like the uh the Jordan Peterson of philosophy, you know, with all the lectures and uh, Jordan Peterson. Oh, oh my goodness. Yeah, he's, you know, Jordan Peterson, see, this would be an example, I know we need to wrap up, but this would be an example of, um, I read one of his books, it was like the 12 rules or this oh, or that, and Jordan yeah, yeah, Peterson yeah. is a, a controversial a controversial figure, and I think sometimes people are surprised that I would read his book, because they know that I'm more like in terms of pol pol politics, like I'm more, and culturally I'm more progressive, I'm feminist, they're like, why would you read Jordan Peterson's book? It's because he is a public figure, intellectual. He's extremely popular. I want to know what the ideas are. And it turns out sometimes he says things 
And he's written things that I think I agree with. Yeah, I do, yeah. It's also the stuff that he writes that I disagree with that I actually appreciate because I have to sit there and think about a response. So the art of conversation and dialogue is not just about agreement and cheering on somebody's idea. You can be grateful for the ideas that you don't agree with because when you're introduced to them, it makes you a better thinker. Yeah. So Jordan Peterson would be an example of that for me. It's not the Socrates thing, uh, thing you mentioned. It's the wisdom of wanting to learn other perspectives because either it changes your perspective or it strengthens your perspective. And either way, exactly, it's a win-win in, in, in that case. Is there any final points you want to, to make or things that you may be um, that we haven't discussed that you would want to quickly explain? I think, no, this, this has been absolutely lovely. Um, we, we did cover, we did cover a lot. Existentialism. We talked about Socrates. This has been an absolutely lovely, a bit of science. Does God exist? We, we went through the whole gambit, social media. We're good. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thanks very much for being a guest on the show. Um, it's a bit like, um, to speak to a few, uh, philosophical experts and it's a bit like having therapy in a, in a sense because I'm I think like that I don't I'm not saying I'm a philosopher or not but I tend to think in a, quite a similar way to those uh, philosophers like yourself and I think it's for me it, it feels a bit like therapy having these conversations which is which is always a good thing good good thank you thank you very much again